started with at least the getting started portion of, of today's event. Um, thank you all for coming, for coming to our um, Data Then and Now seminar. Uh, this is co-hosted with David Rebus of HCDE, and um, you know the, the, the thought behind this series is to provide a platform for thinking about the socio-technical context of data and offering a historical sensibility to understanding our current kind of data-centric moment. Um, and I'm actually going to let Anna Hoffman introduce uh, today's speaker, but I just wanted to, you know, do some logistics. I'm going to pass around these sign-in sheets, so um, please uh, just let us know your name. There's also an email column here. Um, just fill that out if you're interested in finding out about other events that we do with the Data Science Studies Group here on campus. Um, don't worry about it if you already get the emails or, you know, whatever, but so I'll start one in this room. Hi, everybody. I am so thrilled to be here. I'm, I'm very thrilled to be doing this introduction as well. Um, I, have, I, have the, I have the formal, I have the polite one, and then I have a, the impolite anecdote at the oh, end. So yeah, we're going to oh go in, that, oh in good. that order. Yeah. Luke Stark is a postdoctoral researcher in the Fairness, Accountability, Transparency, and Ethics group, um, the FATE group at Microsoft Research Montreal. He's also an affiliate of the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University, trained as a media historian. His scholarship centers on how the histories of psychological and behavioral sciences have shaped the development of digital media and the ways contemporary technologies embody those sciences, norms, and values. Luke's work has been published in journals including Social Studies of Science, Media, Culture, and Society, History of the Human Sciences, and the International Journal of Communication. He has also contributed to a number of edited volumes, including an entry in the Digital SDS Handbook, edited by Janet Bertezzi and our own David Rivas, and, uh, and forthcoming from Princeton University Press. Before joining Microsoft Research, Luke was a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Sociology at Dartmouth College and an inaugural fellow with the University of California Berkeley Center for Technology, Society, and Policy. With her. Yeah, we had a joint project. <laughs> we were both inaugural fellows. And Luke holds a PhD from the Department of Media, Culture, and Communication at New York University and an honors BA at MA in History from the University of Toronto. Um, so Luke and I have known each other for quite a while, and uh, we've quite collaborated a on a number of things. Recently, we've been looking at um, uh, emergent uh, AI ethics discourses as, they, as they've come out of various sort of corners, along with our colleague Dan Green at Maryland. Um, but what, our first collaboration, and people don't know about this, was, um, was, was <laughs> sparked by an absolute, total, undo hatred of the Pixar film Inside Out. <laughs> like this beloved children's film that we came together and it cemented our, 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 our mutual ranting in a, and I believe it was a Twitter DM session. It might have been Possibly, Facebook Messenger. Yeah, something, something and like our that. mutual ranting just cemented this like our sensibilities as friends and colleagues and it ended up with us absolutely trashing this adorable movie in an essay in the Los Angeles Review of Books. And I, and I feel like more people need to know that. So I, I'm so thrilled, and please, uh, please uh, give a warm welcome to uh, to to my, my collaborator and fellow slayer of beloved children's <laughs> films, Luke Stark. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you so much, Anna. Um, I actually, I actually rewatched Inside Out on the plane coming last night. No yeah, I have a problem. I tend to only want to watch children's movies on on flights because I kind of have an issue with flying. And actually, you know. I think I think our piece holds up. I think hold, I, I, there were some there were some there were some like there's there some uh, some elaborations we could do, but it definitely holds up. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that that wonderful introduction. Um, thank you to uh, to David um, to um, Anissa uh, Anissa for being a wonderful host today, um, and thank you for for all being here. It's it's really amazing to have such a high proportion of of um, colleagues, friends, and collaborators in one room, and and it's it's a, you know I, I'm reminded why um, UW is one of my favorite favorite uh, scholarly communities for that reason. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, the Tuana Skokomish, Suquamish, and Puget Sound Salish peoples, so the traditional custodians of the land on which we, the university sits. Um, I ask that we acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced removal from this territory, and honor and respect the indigenous communities still living on and connected to this land by striving for restorative justice for indigenous people and for all people. 
Um, I also uh, want to make very clear uh, that the, uh, the beginning of the talk that my views here are expressed on my own and they do not represent those of my employer or Microsoft Research or Microsoft Corporation more broadly. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I'm sure this will come up later on maybe in Q&A. This is, this is of course a live issue around facial recognition and in Washington State. So we can come back to that. Um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to share my work with such an engaged audience and I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, a really stimulating conversation uh, in the Q&A. So I want to start just juxtaposing two images that uh, in some ways helped um, uh, spawn or, or helped help um, you know create this project in my in my own mind. Um, this is this first is a, a publicity uh, still from Apple um, uh, that was uh, that you can find on their website uh, when they launched their Animoji. Right, they were launched um, uh, with the iPhone 10 in September of 2017. And Apple described these animated facial characters as a quote, a new and more nuanced way to communicate feelings with friends and family within the Apple Message uh, chat application. How, how many people here have an iPhone 10? Does anybody use an, uh, an emoji? Yeah, people use emo an emojis? Okay, good. Sometimes, you know, it's, they were a little newer a year ago when I started thinking about this. That's image one. This is image two. Um, these are two images juxtaposed. They're not on the same page like this, but it seemed apt to juxtapose them. Um, from Charles Darwin's The Expression of the Emotion in Man and Animals, um, published in 1897. On the left is Terror, um, after uh, Duchenne's photograph of an anonymous man whose face was electrified to uh, produce this seemingly stereotypical emotional expression of terror. And uh, the caption on the right is Chimpanzee, Disappointed, and Sulky. Um, and I think I think you know in in the kind of historical gap um, between these two images, there's there's a lot of interesting things to unpack around emotion, animality, and the way that these discourses mediate our understanding of of the human face and of the power that the human face has um, in in society. Okay, so I'll really briefly give a, a little introduction to my scholarship for those of you who don't know, um, a little bit of an overview of critical race scholarship around digital media. Um, I'll articulate then a kind of the kind of thesis of this talk, the chief thesis, which is that, which is that um, at a technical level, at a conceptual level, facial recognition technologies are inherently racist. They're inherently racializing. They inherently produce racial hierarchies um, as a feature of what they do technically. This is a strong technologically deterministic claim, you might say. I don't usually make determinist claims like this, so, um, so I'm going to walk through it pretty slowly. Um, then I'm going to argue that emotion is a really central vector for thinking about these mechanisms of, of uh, racial classification in facial recognition. Uh, and then we can, we can have questions and discuss, and I'm sure you'll have lots to say. Um, so really briefly, my academic trajectory and current work, a lot of it has to do with emotions, emoji, emoticons, et cetera. Um, my, my primary historical work is on the history of computing and emotion um, and on the ways more broadly that the psychological sciences have been incorporated into computing. Um, I've also done work on privacy and surveillance. Um, and more recently, uh, partially because of my role at Microsoft, I've been thinking uh, about ethics and values in AI and data science, although I also come from the kind of tradition of value-sensitive design and value in design, um, which many of you are familiar with here. And here is the obligatory plug for my book project, Orders of Emotion, History of Computing and Human Feeling from Cybernetics to AI. And indeed, there is, there is joy. There she is. She's such, she's such, she's so charming. It's, such a, it's a really great movie if you just bracket all the conceptual stuff like underpinning it. Like, it's very well made. It's, I, mean, I, I cry. I always, I always cry. OK, OK. So race is a technology, racism as a technique. And, I'm, and I, I'm, um, this is, this is you know, laying out um, some, some, this is laying out work that is by no means my own. It's, really grounded in the, in the groundbreaking work of a number of critical race scholars, uh, most of whom I should add are women of color. And I want to acknowledge their expertise and point to them as leaders on this topic. I mean, I'm, 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 this project is totally indebted to that work. And, um, and I, I hope I'm honoring their, their, their work as well. Um, one of those scholars is Faye Harrison, who provides this definition of race. Um, I'm grateful to Manny Morris at CUNY for bringing this to my attention. Race can be understood as an ideologically charged distinction in social stratification and as a social and often legal classification applied to people presumed to share common physical or biological traits. So there's a lot to unpack there, right? Um, but, but I think in some ways this, this definition is, is nicely um, complemented by another, which, um, uh, which comes from Wendy Chun. Uh, who talks about the idea of, of race as a technology, 
right? That 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 in a way that this this ideologically charged distinction that that Harrison talks about is is a kind of technique. It's a kind of te technological feature, right? So instead of as Chun says, instead of thinking about the what of race, we need to think about the how of race, right? How do, how is race produced, right? By both social and technical and socio technical factors in the world, and and how is is this race as a technology, um, you know, a kind of mechanism of power and domination, right? Because because if we, you know, it helps to to understand race as a thing that is doing, right? It's 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 not a kind of a kind of a kind of essential. It's it's a it's a thing that is is at work. And of course, this ties to the, to the definition of, of racialization, right? Which is what uh, Marta, Maria Maldonado defines as the production, reproduction of, and contest over racial meanings, and the social structures in which such meanings become embedded. So again, race is doing something in society. Um, uh, again, so this this was this is a, a quote from Bruce D. Hayes, another race scholar at Fat Star, um, the, the AI Ethics Conference a few weeks ago. Um, race does not cause something; race is caused. Um, I want to make it very clear also that that, that I, this argument in no way effaces the lived effects of these racial categories, right? Um, the, you know, this, just because race is caused doesn't mean it's not real. Race is a real phenomenon. It affects people in very different ways um, and uh, engenders enormous asymmetries of power, access, and well-being. Um, and it's, of course, very important to note this is true of high-status racial groups, right? So like white people in North America, as well as groups uh, oppressed by systems of racial dis discrimination, um, such as white supremacy. So, but in particular, black and indigenous people and racially minoritized groups. So, so right, just because race is caused, and just because it's a technology, doesn't mean it doesn't have huge effects. Um, this is a really, a really, a, a, a useful um, op-ed from a BuzzFeed of all places last year, um, uh, entitled "How to Not Talk About Race and Genetics," and and what it does is is lays out, you know, a, a, a kind of a kind of way, the way to think about, I think, the scientifically sound way to think about population variation, right? Um, you know, popula ver population variation, right? It's not consistent with biological definitions of race, nor does that variation map precisely onto ever-changing socially defined racial groups, right? So, so in, in other words, right, there is variation in populations, but it doesn't match up to the things, that, the, 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 kind of, the kind of hierarchies of power that race as a technology produces. And I, I bring this up because I think there's a, a strong analogy to be made between, oops, sorry, between genetics and facial recognition, right? So facial recognition um, and the face, the human face, involves somatic features, right, that like genetic variation also varies between groups, but also doesn't have any kind of, kind of direct correspondence either between biological groupings or social construction. And yet, right, as Simone Brown and, and many other scholars have observed, facial recognition technologies and other systems that class, just classify data about the face are, are already agents of, of, of creating these kind of essentializing categories. Um, facial res, anima, fa, these kind of facial animation and classification systems enact the process that Simone Brown calls digital epidermalization, right, the imposition of race on the body through the schematization of human facial features. So, so the, this, this, the human skin and the human, the human face are, are the sites where race is a technology does its work and creates categories. And so here, here again is, is Chun, and, and she makes this point, you know, the modern value of race stems from its ability to link somatic differences to innate physical and mental characteristics. And I put here putatively innate, supposedly innate characteristics, right? So there's a kind of desire to map the exteriority of the body um, onto, onto, hierarch onto kind of perceived interior hierarchies. And when modern here, you know, this is modern. This is modern for a historian. Modern here is is modern in in its long durée sense, in the long history. So, right, um, there's a long history of making such links tied to the history of measurement and to the the history of of trying to, to, to understand the body through scientific techno practice, right? So this is um, Jean Battista de la Porta. Um, and initially, right, in the early, in the early modern period, these associations were, were sort of metaphorical, right? So in this, in this image, right, that it sort of make, it makes the case that somebody who looks like a pig is piggish. And so note, note how many layers of, of kind of social construction are going on here, right? So, so and not just here in, the, in this idea, but in this image. So you have somebody drawn to look like a pig, 
and a pig drawn to look like the person that's been drawn like a pig. And a set of associations put on the poor pig, right, the animal, right, that are then back transcribed to the human that has been made to look like the animal. So there's a, there's a set of, of, kind, of kind of really actually kind of like elaborate and, and, and you might say illogical associations happening between, you know, in this kind of, in this kind of you know, qualitative association making. And of course, of course it had, this has to do with power. Um, you know, the use of the animal as a mediator here, drawn to make the tie between human features and more values explicit. You know, it's a value judgment about both the humans and the pigs. Um, the, the history of physiognomy, um, you know, sort of is a history of, of kind of from going from sort of metaphorical association to standardizations often based on, on supposedly kind of quanti quantitative ob objectivity or kind of measurements of scale. So here, this is um, Johann Lavate um, in 1778, right? Um, interested in finding physiognomic uh, relations, you know, physio physiognomy related to specific character traits, not just general types. So, you know, you can sort of, you sort of see the, this is the, these are the four humors, right? We have collar and, and phlegmatic up here. I, I assume that's sanguine and melancholic, right? So there's, instead of uh, sort of, sort of being this metaphorically associational, there's some sort of rough order. Um, but Lombroso, right, in 1876, right, really, you know, at the moment of a kind of the kind of the efflorescence of industrial modernity, the bureaucratic state, and the desire of the state to um, gain control and, and uh, characterization of its populations, um, takes this one step further and and sort of uh, sort of postulates that traits are not just indicative of character, but that they're inheritable, right? That you can see certain traits that are criminal and certain traits that aren't. Um, and, uh, you know, go, going on this idea, Sir Francis Galton, um, you know, a pioneer of many, many fields, including statistics, and also uh, eugenics, um, believed that you could do composite portraits of criminals to find the kind of common feature that, that, that existed between them. This was not very successful, um, but it didn't, you know, it didn't deter him. So, I bring this slide back because because this this interest in categorizing the face and categorizing hierarchies of, of 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 you know value within the face and within the human is is tied quite closely to this to Darwin's work thinking about emotion in man and animals right so this this again is is a kind of this is a kind of classic book in the history of emotion um, and. And the, the the point the point is is that there there an attempt to kind of distinguish what is human and what is not human through what kind of physiognomic responses they produce and what that tells you about what's inside, right? So so the key the key insight from this work for Darwin was that um, uh, animals don't don't have humor they don't laugh, and so because of that we can tell by this because they lack this exterior signal that there's some that they're not they're not you know like human they lack something that humans have. Now, uh, as many of you probably know, um, by the early 20th century, uh, the, this, this, this kind of uh, this history of physiognomy, you know, has developed into a, into a full-fledged theory of scientific racism, right? So you have, um, uh, and I apologize in advance um, uh, for the, the kind of extraordinarily problematic images I'm going to show. Um, so you have manuals like this. This is Vought's Practical Character Reader, right? That suggests you can tell the character what you know what, what, uh, from the kind the body part that touches. This line, right? Um, uh, you know, uh, we, you know, we, we kind of, kind of doing again a kind of, a kind of quantitative, a very, a very, a very, uh, you know, lightweight quantitative metric of, of character through physiognomy. Um, you have images like this um, from 1937, right? That does a kind of, again, kind of makes this kind of arbitrary distinction around around lines of the face and and calls it grades of intelligence. Oh, okay, um, and and so the point here is that there is this this long history of of associating, you know, of, uh, associating the, the face and somatic features with with hierarchies of value. Okay, so 
so we've moved past that now, right? We're, we're, we're more enlightened. We're, we're, we're further along, we hope, we think, maybe. Um, I'll say, first of all, so this is racial, facial recognition as a, as a racializing technology. Um, I'm, uh, there's, I, I'm using facial recognition here as a shorthand, right, just to um, talk about systems, any system that engages an identification of the human face. So recognition systems identify specific individuals. Detection systems just determine if there's a face or not. Um, and facial analysis systems try to identify aspects of a face, like gender or race or age. But I'm, I, I think the, all three of these systems um, suffer from the same problems, and so I'm, I'm lumping them together um, in this conversation. So, um, you know, again, many critical race scholars have talked about how com computers and computation have shaped ha and been shaped by racial policy law and categorization, right? So the history of race and the history of computers are tightly intertwined. Um, uh, so Nakamura, Chun, Brown, Safia Noble, and many other critical race scholars have detailed the ways these racial categorizations are built into the logic of digital systems of class classification and enumeration. Uh, facial recognition is no, no different, and in fact, as many of you probably know as well, there's been much recent attention to racial bias in these systems. Yes? Should that be shaped and been shaped? Oh, probably. Thank you. Um, so, uh, research by MIT's Joy Bellamwini and uh, Google's Tim Jebru has found leading tech companies' commercial AI systems significantly misidentified women and darker-skinned individuals, and especially darker-skinned women in her Gender Shades project. Um, as Bellamwini writes, um, evaluation needs to be intersectional instead of examining male versus female, light versus dark. We also need to look at the intersections of these categories, so darker females, darker males, lighter females, and lighter males. Um, and in a follow-up paper uh, published last month, Bulamwini um, uh, and a co-author, you know, continue to find that ma major accuracy gaps around identification of uh, faces do remain in these systems. There have also been a number of groundbreaking reports noting the ways facial recognition is used in, in, to, in, to reinforce existing systems of power and domination uh, that often involve racial bias, such as police over surveillance and incarceration of African Americans. Right? So Georgetown University's Perpetual Lineup Report from 2016 is one good example of that. And there are also, uh, there's been work, um, as documented by Safia Noble in her book Algorithms of Oppression, about representational harms, so the ways um, that Search, you know, search uh, uh, this, 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 this scandal in 2015 where uh, Google Photos were particularly labeled black people gorillas. Um, and I should also, this is just one kind of representational, representational harm. Um, our own Anna Hoffman has written about representational harm in context of around, around trans people and, and other, other kind of similar questions. Um, and so, so broadly speaking, there's been a lot of, a lot of conversation about how we should pay attention to facial recognition as a broader, uh, as you being used as a broader part of systems of structural oppression, right? So, so this is this is Eleanor Nelson, the president of the SSRC, right? She 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 wants to point out that facial recognitions are a tool being used um, to perpetuate uh, oppression and and uh, uh, discrimination. But a common theme of many of the responses to racial bias and, and, and racial racism in facial recognition is that there are fixes to the problems involved, right? That these are things we can solve. So the fixes might be technical, right? They might involve improved accuracy. They might improve better data sets. Um, or they might be social, right? They might involve um, you know, making sure we don't use these technologies um, irresponsibly, right? And in fact, some of the fixes are, are so, are, you know, some of the, some of, some of the, these, some of the, Critics of facial recognition are uh, are so concerned about the social impacts um, of of the technologies, um, like in this op-ed by Evan Selinger and Woody Herzog, um, that they say it just should be banned outright. Right? Um, Herzog and Selinger's argument is that uh, facial recognition is so is so toxic to so so deleterious to norms of privacy and autonomy, to our democratic functioning, that that uh, it's this is why it should be gotten rid of. Um, they, they they do note that facial recognition has a disproportionate impact on people of color and other minority populations, um, but they but the, but the point here is sort of a general point about its use in a democratic society. I'm going to make a slightly different. Uh, and I think in some ways more, more challenging claim, right, which is that facial recognition technologies, by, virtue, by the virtue of their technical affordances, are inevitably racializing. And so will always produce hierarchies of racial discrimination and categorization. Right? It's, it's, it's a technical problem that you can't fix. It's inherent in the, the kind of material structure of the technology itself. And again, I, I admit this is a strong claim. And I don't make it lightly. So please bear with me. 
OK, so, so why, what's, what's behind this claim? So I've talked about a little bit about the history of physiognomy and the history of scientific racism. And physiognomy you know, is a problem well known to the facial recognition community, the technical community. So this is a blog post um, in a blog post by, by uh, Blaise Iguera Iarcas, who's a, a machine learning uh, facial recognition scientist at Google, and his uh, a colleague, Margaret Mitchell at Google. Um, they spent a really long time talking about uh, you know, bad facial recognition research that kind of draws on this history of physiognomy that I've just run through. Um, bad research like this study, the study um, that caused a bit of a stir 20, in 2016, automated inference on criminality using face images, right, which, uh, which uh, suggested that there were, there were innate qualities of, of facial, uh, the faces of criminals out of a, uh, out of a, a several of Chinese data sets, one of criminal ID photos and one of just uh, random people. Does anyone remember what, what, uh, what, the, what the, like, I think fairly dispositive critique of this study was? Yeah. Yeah, it's a smile detector, right? So this idea that there's a, there's a social, there's a social reason why the people in the top are frowning and the people in the bottom are smiling is because they're, they're they're upset that they've been charged in a crime and they're they're not, right? So that's that's one. Okay, so that's that's a problem, all right. Um, and then we had this they had this paper, right? This is by by Yulan Wang and Michael Kaczynski, right? Um, this question about about uh, gaydar using using facial recognition as gaydar, right? That the, the claim was that um, you could determine uh, sexual orientation f again simply through the face. So here are our Blasey Arcus, uh, the same people go to Medium again to write another blog post, once again debunking this physiognomic um, research. Does anyone remember what what this one was debunked by? Yes. Robert called it AI phrenology. Well, yes, it is a, right. It's a, but, 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 but do, do you know remember what what they what what the what the kind of mechanism the co the correlative mechanism was would, that they that they, they identify what's happening here? Yeah. Well, they, they, they make a claim that this is based on uh, basically hormone exposure, being able to hormone exposure, giving rise to this. Well, that's in the yeah, that, that's, what, that's the paper's claim. What's, what's the critique? What the, what the critique is, is that, well, these are all cultural indicators right. that people are using. Right. Glasses, facial position, makeup, what have you, they, et cetera. They seem, yeah. right. right. So, but, but again, I, I just want to flag something interesting about, about both these debunkings of these papers, right? They're actually debunkings that, at bottom, um, reinforce the kind of legitimacy of facial recognition technologies. Because what they're saying is these technologies are really good at reading the outside of the skin, the surface of, uh, the, surface of the face, right? They're, they're contesting what's happening inside, but, they're, but, they're, but, 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 the, but you know, these the, this folks from Google are saying, well, actually, this is, these are really good at doing these correlations with, with kind of things on the outside. And so, you know, we, we in some ways should trust these te technologies to, to, to make, those, make those kind of correlations, right? Implicit in these critiques is a celebration of these technologies to accurately read surface. And the problem is misunderstanding the results, right? Um, so I think, I think there's a deeper problem with these technologies, right? So very, very um, broadly speaking, right, facial recognition involves identifying, extracting, and selecting contrasting patterns in an image and classifying and comparing them to a previously compiled data set of other patterns, right? So it's, it's about representing a, a numerical, numerical values to schematic representations of the face and comparing those values, often between light and dark, right? So there we're kind of these, our, our, our faces are, are turned into differentials of, of, of different, between different, different kind of, different intensities of pixels. And I think that the challenge becomes that there's not that much different from those kind of value correlations than the kind of much more you know, you know, broad-based kind of, kind of, kind of uh, correlations that, that happen in phrenology. So, so this is a, diff a difference of degree, but not of kind. All right. So, so we have this is a kind of the kind of point matrix, right, uh, of unique features. Um, you know, you sort of look at, at, the, at the kind of different the different vari variations of of position on the face. But I want to go back to this definition by Chun, right? That the modern value of race stems from its ability to link somatic differences to innate physical and mental characteristics. So, so these systems are, by definition, linking somatic differences to physical and mental characteristics, right? To, to innate in that they exist, there they are, right? And, and so the question then becomes, is this kind of differentiation is, is, is it always going to produce kind of a, a kind of a kind of racial ordering, a racial hierarchy? Um, and my answer is yes. 
Why is that? Um, it's instructive to think a little bit about emotion and to think a little bit about the, the, the kind of the kind of way that that this differentiation happens um, outside of facial recognition to, to get some insight on, on this point, right? Um, you know, Alex Galloway makes this 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 I think profound observation that you know the more that you separate yourself from uh, what he calls the mire of terrestrial stereotyping, right? The more the more we, the more we try to get away from the actual historical conditions of racial discrimination, the more free and flexible the bigotry machine becomes. The more we create these these systems of categorization and hierarchies um, in order to you know to do different things. So this is this is from this is a, an image from World of Warcraft, right? So you have a kind of a kind of categorization of the the races, right? They are called races in World of Warcraft, World of Warcraft, um, based on their capabilities, you know, their stamina, their their endurance, their speed, you know, their their height, right? You have you can you kind of you kind of think about these 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 races as sets of numerical quantifiers, and you rank them, right? You decide which one you would prefer for any given condition. Um, uh, the, the, this point is underscored by, by again by Michel Foucault, right? Who who basically makes this point that racism is is a mechanism of power. You know, going back to Chun, racism as a, as, a, as a kind of technology, and as the basic mechanism of power as exercised by states, right? It's it, it has to do with the, the the very need to differentiate by a state, the need to create classes of people to order and to and to and to, and to organize and potentially to exclude. And so, and so I think I think it, it, it you know it, the the question for me is not whether facial recognition systems are kind of have a kind of have produce a kind of textbook definition of racial classification, right? But but how how that mechanism plays out and why why it's a problem? Well, of course it's a problem. Okay, so oh all right. Um, okay, so Animoji, right? I mean, Animoji are a, a case in point. Animoji were clearly ad intended to avoid any kind of race at all, right? By by focusing on anthropomorphizing not you know the human characters of the of the of the emoji character set, but animated animal types, right? Um, and yet, and yet, even animation, even these cartoony characters, you know, can't escape this this question of, of racial ordering. Um, Cianai, affect theorist, you know, argues persuasively that to be animated in American culture is to be racialized. In some way, and of course, the, these avatars are are activated, are motivated, are are, are produced by the same kind of you know pixel matrix um, system in the iPhone X um, as as other kinds of facial recognition, right? So so uh, animojis track more than 50 muscle movements. Claims you know Apple, um, you know your your face is your password, of course, in, in the in the iPhone 10, um, and this is a kind of a nice privacy loss leader to get you to give them your facial data, right? So there. So then we have this this kind of view of the face as a series of dots. But, but again, the, the fundamental problem with facial recognition is, is that they attach these numerical values to the human face. Right? Um, as Brown and other scholars have observed, the, these technologies and other systems visually classify for visually classifying human bodies are inevitably and always means by which race as a constructed category is, is both defined and made visible. Right? Race is, a, again, a kind of technology, a kind of thing that happens. This is where race is constructed. And so, right, variation, variation of the face, right, whether it's done in a kind of very crude way through physiognomy or a kind of very, very kind of precise way through these systems, um, you know, is not consistent with biological definitions of race, and nor does that variation map precisely onto the kind of, kind of social definitions of race. Um, and that's the problem, right? That that that, that 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 intrinsically to these to these systems is a kind of creation of a hierarchy based on these numbers. Okay, so where does emotion play into this? Um, this is just another amazing image from the from the app, um, uh, the, the uh, emoji launch. Although it's kind of a little hard to see, you have the kind of, this kind of juxtaposition of both the cute kind of kind of kind of cuddly figure of the bear, and then the 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 you know the like reticulated spline version of the face being being picked up by the by the camera. Um, so. Um, the power of race as a social signifier, right, as Nakamura points out, is 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 both amplified and reduced when it's turned into a data point, right? So it it it, be, it slides into the background of these systems, but it also becomes more more visible or more real because precisely because it it undergirds how uh, people are categorized through these systems. And 
I, I think I think key to this is again the kind of this kind of point of the schematization of emotion and affect, right? It it's very conventionalized. So here we have some emoji, right? So emoji are conventionalized signifiers. Emoji themselves have also had some category some some some. Uh, uh, controversies around racial categorization we can get into in questions, but but the problem right is that that when you start to think about the kind of schematic categorization of the human face, and you start to track emotional signals, you you overlay that 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 second form of kind of kind of, uh, of classification on top of this already kind of problematic category, you you know you get you get you get problems. Um, uh, so for Darwin, right, emotion in animals was an argument for evolution of humans, right? But it was also a kind of argument for the hierarchization of races, right? It was made through a kind of subjective appeal to character as manifested in, in emotion and mood and personality. So um, emotion becomes a mediator through which these hierarchies of value get worked out. To the point where in, in kind of classical for classical in kind of in phrenology, this is again from Vought's Practical Character Reader. You know, you have a kind of again a kind a kind of metaphorical or illusionistic kind of uh, kind of <laughs> kind of vision of of uh, of uh, animals, character, and humans. Right. This is this is so like this idea that that. Um, and people that look like animals have the same characteristics that you have, but you how you have described ascribed to animals. So. I don't think it's possible at a technical level to separate the workings of, of associating schematically mapped parts of the face, including emotional expressions, um, with a kind of quantitative comparison, ordering, and ranking of those expressions. Um, you know, even perhaps especially if these systems are able to map each and every human face precisely, the technical capacities of physiological somatic classification produce this kind of visual analog to the population difference versus racial, racial categories argument in genetics. So it produces the same problem um, in talking. You know, it, it, it produces the same kind of sets of categories. Or, um, or, or forms of categorization, um, and and of course the the challenge then when you get into, into emotion in motion classification is it is an emotion contemporary forms of motion classification are are based on precisely these same kind of somatic features, right? Um, so this is um, on the left is uh, a still from uh, the work of Paul Ekman, right? Who developed what's called the facial act action coding system, a way of of determining, in his view, the kind of again the kind of uh, correlation between inner emotional states and external muscle movements. Um, inspired by Darwin, right? So on the on the on the right is an image from Darwin's um, expression of emotion in man and animals. And so again, the, the argument here is 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 not that um, is is again is is not is not to say anything about Ekman per se, but to say the technologies he he helped perfect. Um, you know, uh, are are have these kind of problematic tendencies. You know, in in their kind of, in the, the kind of mechanism of their of their working. Um, and so uh, you have in today's kind of emotion uh, tracking technologies um, from companies like Affectiva. This is Affectiva's emotion tracking technology. You have um, many of the same problems around racial racial bias that you have in general facial recognition technologies. This is this is work from Lauren Rue and Wake, Wake Forest University, looking at how um, emotion recognition is is not good at determining the emotions of uh, African Americans. It determines that the face on the on the uh, left is happy, and the face on the right is not happy. And when all of these different kinds, you know, kind of mechanisms around around classification and ordering get get packaged in commercial systems, um, you can produce kind of horrific event, uh, outcomes like this, right? So, so this was a, a few years ago, face apps, um, uh, which is a kind of one of these kind of face kind of modification apps, um, you know, producing a kind of a kind of a kind of like handsomeness fi filter, which makes you look more European. Okay, so um, I have hopefully done all these things. I provided an overview of critical race scholarship. I've sought to articulate facial recognition as a racializing technology, and I've argued for some of the ways that emotional classification plays into these kind of systems of race. And I think it's important to, to note right now that I think I think the the point about about the schematization of emotion as a way of of kind of doing these racial classifications depends on the the broader, more base argument about about the kind of intrinsic racialization of these systems. Right? They you can't pick one or the other. Right? It's it, it's all of a piece of of this kind of the kind of looking for kind of external similarities um, and and producing these categorizations. 
So when a journalist like Sidney Fussell asks, can we make non-racist face recognition, I think the answer to this is no. Right, um, and it's a message that I think lawmakers are hearing from many quarters. I think um, there's a, 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 a hearing today uh, at the University of Washington, uh, so I thought, well, not U.S. Washington, that the, the Washington State Legislature on the, the bills that are you know circulating right now, um, and I think this is this is a kind of a, you know a kind of a clear problem actually for any you know any of these any of these bills. <laughs> Um, and I and I guess I mean I think I think part of implicit in this argument is that racism is emergent in these systems, right? In some ways, I think if you if a society was not racist, these systems would produce racist outcomes because of the way that they structure and hierarchize the face. Um, this, of course, is not the only problem with facial recognition. I've already de 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 detailed a whole bunch earlier. Um, you know, um, researchers here at, at UW, like Ghost Keys, have pointed out the problem around misgendering and around, around the, 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 the inability of many facial recognition, to, facial recognition systems to, um, to, uh, you know, to uh, detect or, or consider uh, transgender people. Um, and but of course, uh, while this is all going on, we have a, a huge proliferation of these systems um, in uh, consumer activities, um, certainly in, cons in, in commercial tech, but um, across a wide range of sectors. Um, you know, I am heartened that uh, there has been uh, some some interest in regulation from. Uh, tech companies, including my own from Microsoft, um, but. Um, I think it's telling. I think it's kind of telling where the, where the kind of arguments for regulation for regulation start and end. So so Brad Smith, um, the president of Microsoft, um, called for reg vigorous regulation of these systems, and he observed the utility of regulation in areas such as I quote automobiles, air safety, food, and pharmaceutical products. Right. Um, so 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 he's making an argument that these systems are you know analogous to some of these everyday everyday um, consumer goods. So, so I take metaphors of data, of data and, and technology seriously, partially because of some of the work I'm doing with Anna um, uh, on, um, on metaphors and data science. And, and I, think, I think that this, this idea that facial recognition has a kind of inherent racializing function um, points to classes of technologies that are inevitably dangerous, right, and yet may still have some Utility and I, so the analogy that I'm pointing to here is plutonium, right? Is is uh, you know kind of highly toxic, hazardous waste, hazardous substances that are used in a very very narrow set of use cases, right? So so just as, as plutonium is toxic to the body, facial recognition is toxic to the social body, right? For all of the reasons that I've that that, that other people have already enumerated, and also I think because it produces these racializing hierarchies. And, and so this points to a broader problem for values in design or values in design um, scholars. How do we convey the negative impacts of these socially toxic, toxic technologies to the public? How do we make clear right, um, that I, I, you know, in the way analogous to having your hair fall out if you, if you get radiation poisoning? Not that I want anybody's hair to fall out. Um, and, and how do we, how do we um, choose to use these kind of socially toxic technologies um, in the few cases that they may potentially be useful. Um, there are very few cases that facial recognition is actually, I think the benefits will outweigh the costs. Um, we can maybe talk about that in Q&A. Um, it, it may, you know, so, 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 so the, I guess the takeaway today for this talk, right, is that, is that facial recognition may, while it may have some practical uses, its racializing effects are so potentially toxic that its widespread use doesn't outweigh the risks. Um, so to avoid the social toxicity um, that, that uh, the, this technology will bring, not least because of the way it produces racial categories, um, they need to be understood for what they are, uh, nuclear level threats to be handled with care. So if you're interested in more of this work, um, uh, this, these are just some of the sites. Um, work a little bit related on emoji is, is from 2015. Um, the piece uh, last year and first Monday really really digs in more in more detail to the kind of connections between animation, emotion, and race that I tried to lay out here. Um, and I have something forthcoming in the student magazine of the ACM titled Facial Recognition is a Platonic of AI, which um, makes that kind of connection. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I look forward to your comments.
Yes. So you uh, talked a bit about the about the uh, two kind of um, you know the criminal faces and then the Gadar um, studies, and then you suggested that the that the debunkings were uh, celebrating the technologies. How would you have people respond? Um, I think that I think the debunkings were, were helpful as as far as they went. Um, I think that I think what's interesting about both those debunkings is that neither of them particularly addressed race and racial bias, which was which was interesting. They did at a high level, but they in the in the kind of in the kind of in the kind of rejection of scientific racism as a, and physiognomy as a, as a kind of false science. Um, but I don't think that 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 they take take their conclusions as where they where they might might lead them, right? Which is to say that um, that if there's a kind of a kind of a kind of problem with reading external signs, right? That 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 the kind of the kind of intrinsic, you know, the kind of the kind of somatic features of the face, you know, that it's hard to escape producing these categories through these technologies. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Um, No, I mumbled to that a bit. I mean, no, so I think so. My, my, my last reading, Microsoft has endorsed one, not very, not maybe very good bill, and has 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 come out against the other bill, uh, as far as I understand it. I don't know if so. My, the point I don't think it does. I mean, the point is that I think I think actually, uh, I think I think that I think that Microsoft is, and again, I'm speaking for myself, is not walking the walk on what it's talking about, um, and I think that that's unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I have a, a what I consider like a lighter question and a heavier question. Let's do the heavy one first. Oh yeah. Yeah, of course. No, we need the lighter one. First. Okay. I, I'm ordering. Sure. Okay. Um, archiving. Um, all right. So one one of the things you I think you, you came back to I think it was a Chun. Yes. Thing, yeah. Um, where it's so like the face is understood to stand in for something deeper. Yeah. And so I I think I understand that critique, but like. Many occasions, facial recognition is not used to stand in for anything deeper. So, what what do you say about those? I and mean, examples might be to use homosexuality and criminality. But what about like identifying a person and saying like this person is this person, right? Right. Where it's not saying anything substantively deep about that person, or something like counting the number of people in a room or something like that. Right. right. I just want to know like chairs versus people. Right. Okay, so that's the yeah. lighter question. Okay. But the deeper question, I think, is um, so you, you kind of suggested that like somewhere deep in the machinery, uh -huh. there is like an ongoing hierarchization and structuration of the face. And that's that's your argument about the inherent quality. I don't, I don't feel like I've seen that in this presentation, right? Like. Mm. I would think that if that exists in the software, there's a material thing that could be demonstrable. You could show me like a hierarchization happening, and I don't feel like I saw that. And I'm just did I miss it, or, or well, I'm, well, you might. I mean, I might not have. I might not have articulated it very well. I mean, I think so. I think. I think that actually the answer to the two questions goes, goes together, right? Um, so this this is from IBM. This is this is from an IBM paper that just came out like a couple of weeks ago, seeking to um, improve the, accu the, the like accuracy of facial recognition by I think I, I I can't remember how many. It's like it's more than it's like tens of different metrics, right? And. So I mean, I guess maybe this is a, there's an argument that it's not the the system; it's it's the database that the system, that the objects in the system go into. But implicitly in that database, you can you can run that data. You can you can run any kind of like you know numerical evaluation you want. You could you could say whatever whatever Z Y is there. You could find the highest and the lowest value for Z Y, and there you there you could there you've got a hierarchy. So I so I'm certain I'm not arguing I'm I'm not arguing that. The, the kind of the kind of hierarchies in these systems will 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 exactly mirror um, racial hierarchies that ex that are that exist, although they probably will. Um, and that's the point that I think if you if you put this if you use these technologies, you would begin to create new hierarchies. I'm saying that the hierarchy point itself is is the problem. And I think your first question was about the, Charm, like the inside of, like right. Well, and so I think and I think right. And so I think that's that that's of a piece of what I just said, which is that. 
that that the 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 kind of the kind of comparison, even if the comparison has no referent, it produces a kind of in, a kind of inside. That does not that, by which I mean that like you're you're creating you're creating an implied value by by putting these two images in 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 numerical equivalent in equivalence or or, or, or um, contestation. Does that so I so right so so it's you're right. I mean this this is this is the tricky part of this argument, right? Which is that obviously these systems quantify the phase. Obviously they produce these numeric these patterns. What is in, what is intrinsic about it? And and the intrinsicness to me is is just the fact of of producing these kind of classifications. And 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 again, I think I think it's important to understand this as a, as I think why China is so useful in, in her point about race as a technology is that it it's it, it focuses on this as a technology as something that that, that like generates you know generates these 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 um, these comparisons and 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 thus these hierarchies of value. Oh boy, that's a lot of hands. Yeah. I'll, I'll I, just, I want to extend on this very quickly. Okay. Uh, in, 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 this is really fascinating, right? And even in the, that simplified like face or chair example, like to make sure like how many people are here, what are faces, what are chairs, right? You make this um, this face not face, and then there are going to be certain cases where that fails, and then the the answer becomes perfecting the system right and so you are you are are you are continuing to create this kind of like um, this kind of uh, this this ultimate distinction They're, these are distinction machines yeah right? yeah and right. and, uh, and and when the answer to like when it goes wrong is that we just need to make it better at making these distinctions it that reinforces the intrinsic nature of these as like distinction making machines right Mike um, Luke uh, Greek presentation like you're doing this work. Um, so I thought I, I, was, I was spinning out of my head like all of the worst case scenarios. Um, and one of them was the, the use of, like, of using this as a risk assessment tool, which obviously law enforcement is already doing. Yeah, yeah, of course. Thinking about yeah. the future of like, real-time risk assessment where you point the camera at somebody and you decide, you're about to do a crime. Right. You're about to you know, pull a weapon or something like that, and then responding to that based on the but I was also thinking about something, I was wondering if you thought about this when thinking about the hierarchy of distinctions. Um, what about the case of things that facial recognition is unlikely to detect? And not because it's, it can't, but because it's a choice that designers are not going to make because nobody's buying it. So for example, oh, my facial recognition system detects you know, pacifism or detects like um, you know, politeness. Um, well, politeness, they are, that, that is of interest, like to hiring, for instance, right? So I, I mean, and I think at a, at a broad level, I mean, I, I, think, I, think, I think it's the act of assigning a, 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 a value to, to, or finding a proxy and then assigning a value to the proxy that, that is the problem there, right? Um, and that's kind of... I was wondering about, like, the, then there's, like, the negative space, like, the things that are left out. I'm wondering if you sort of thought about that as the another hierarchical problem. Well, sure, and that's, uh, yeah, right. These, like, right, right, or, right. You know, homosexuality, whatever, and then right. ignore all these other qualities. Right, and that was Anna's point, and I think, and that's also Os Osa's point, I think, is, is this, this point about, yeah, the kind of, the kind of, the kind of, uh, that's, that's another kind of, a kind of harm these systems produce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just following on your response, uh, it sort of seems like you are saying that any conversion from a person to a number, or any measurement, is potentially problematic in that it creates material which could be used for people that want to buy people. There's, I, mean, I don't totally disagree with that, and there's obviously reasons to focus on face recognition is it's salient and it's historical connections. Is there something more than that? Like there, yeah, there might. I mean, yeah. So, so the the the, the interesting ed, the, an edge case that. Um, James Grimmelman at Cornell Tech asked me to think about, which I am thinking about, I don't have an answer, is gate recognition. You know, so gate, right, so, you know, again, is a kind of a, gate has been racialized, right, there's plenty of, the, right, that's, that's actually a lot of Nye's work, because Nye's work is about, about the kind of the body and the shape of the body. Yeah, I think, I, yeah, I, well, I mean, and, and we see this in genetics, right, where genetics, which is like totally a kind of, a kind of, you know, has, is very distinct from uh, somatic features and yet gets, gets produced around race. So, yeah, it's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. So the previous question is a little more confused, which I think is great. Okay. Um, but I, I'm having a hard time sort of following the equivalence you're making between quantification, hierarchization, and classification. Right? Fair. Um, so maybe you could say a little bit more about where in this process of turning images into numbers and then assigning sort of meanings or labels or interpretations to the classifications to those numbers, where in that process 
does it sort of become intrinsically racialized? I think, is it like right. Is any image that you've turned into numbers, which is any image that you're storing on a computer, if that's a problem? Or is it somewhere later in the process? Right. So I think, I think the, the point here, right, to return, where is this, where is the, where is the definition? Right. I think, I think the point, right, is that, is that race as a technology involves, right, this point about somatic differences, right, so like, so like, you know, kind of the kind of, right, and making that kind of equivalence. So, so, and so part of, part of the point, you know, this is why I say that like the kind of image, you know, um, De La Porta's image of the pig and these systems are different in, in degree, but not in kind, right? The, the, the early, mo so, so like, so the, so, Sorry. So back, 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 back. So like this. So like this image, right? So this image is 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 doing a kind of a non-quantitative equivalence making, right? right? And Im so and and contemporary systems are doing a quantitative equivalence making, right? But the the problem is that the quantitative the, the, you, the, that qu quantitative systems are all about equi make, making equivalences in organizations, right? Or or, or classifying or well, classifying systems. Or, 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 yeah. Yeah. So so I'm, so there's a, there's a the, the metric you know you you you, you don't have to draw a human being like this or a pig like this, but the affordance of, of the of the of the quanti the, quanti the quantified face pushes you into a kind of path dependence of, of racial categorization. Does that, does that, someone answer your question? I think I'm too fixated on the difference between the picture of the dots and the, picture, the later pictures you showed of facial recognition systems that had sort of more complex features. Okay, like yeah. Out. Say more. I think it happened with some, I think there's something happening between point A, so, so like, pixels to numbers and point, so this, yeah. this is one thing, Yeah. but then, is, some steps between this and that, I think that might be something else. This is where the that labels have been pointed out have been put on right? right, but I guess I'm saying that I think I think this, even this, because of the fact that it it is it is mapping the face and make and even within a face finding finding differentiation, right? I think even so I think what's different between this and a photo? Because you're not, well, you're not, you're not, well, I mean, right, I mean, you're trying, I mean, look, Galton is trying to do this, right, and failing in, uh, where's my Galton picture, right? So, so you can use a photo for this, right, but a photo can also be used in other ways, right? Whereas, I think in, intrinsic to the, it's, it's, it's because, it's because of the, uh, the kind of, the kind of, the kind of, kind of, kind of computational chewing up of these systems that, that this is an intrinsic problem. Uh. Yeah. Great talk, Luke. Uh, in your talk, you were alluding to some of the conversations that you had with facial recognition software developers and showing us the interface or showing us the innards of these uh, machines. And I would just like to hear more about any conversations that you've had with developers and what reactions you get from them when you're articulating your. Right. Haven't haven't had enough. I mean, I think uh, actually, and I would love to have more. Um, th there does tend to be a distinction people make between the different types, so recognition, analysis, identification. I think that's, and so it's sort of like, well, maybe, maybe analysis is a problem, maybe just identification is, is okay. I think that goes to your point, David. And I, I just, I'm, I really, ha I'm, I have, I think I have kind of a kind of conceptual concern about that distinction. Um, but I would wel really welcome um, more, more on this. I, I'm, yeah. Uh, back there, and then here, and then back there. Yes. Well, yes, but I mean, I think I think the point. I think the reflexivity, and I think this ties to a, a broader discourse that um, that in the paper with Dan Green and Anna uh, that we've written about, and that other people are now actually writing about, uh, is and, and is is it kind of ex especially extant in kind of political movements around tech is reflexivity at the beginning of the design process. Like, don't do it. To write, just don't don't build the thing, right? Or don't apply it in this context. And I think I think that's why I think I, again. You know, so so Herzog and Selinger call for a total ban. Um, 
my, my take is a little more nuanced, which is, is to regulate it so tightly that it's essentially a ban, right? If there's, if there's, if there's a, a, a one use case for facial recognition, um, you know, regulate it like plutonium, put it, you know, put it in trucks, special trucks, you know, AKA, spe you know, special devices, whatever. But, but that, um, I think that's where the reflexivity is. I just, I just think that, I think that the, I think at this point, the, 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 the negatives of, of the technology are so clear that, that it just, you know, that, that we, that this is the conversation we need to be having about it. And they're, they're clear because even if Microsoft, if even Microsoft is talking about regulating it, it, it shows that they know it's a problem. They just want, they, you know, they, they want, they want, uh, you know, they want, re they want regulation that is, that is, you know, they want, they want re regulation friendly to their interests, but they know they, they even, they're, they're articulating the fact that they need regulation. Okay. The schematizing and ordering that takes place around these technologies happens around a lot of other things that are problematic too. So I am curious about how, if 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 it's, if it's not just a moment where we're making and ordering quite right, all of these steps that go in, where PS was, where you decide to put PS and where you download, like that's all summative, right? So where else would the you know where are those opportunities to when you're deciding where PS is going to go or not? That, that's built into all, you know, every technology that's that's leading us to an ordering, right? Well, but not, but not well. So, uh, right, all all racializing technologies are about ordering, but not all ordering technologies are racist, right? I think I think there's, right. I mean, in in as much as you know, so the you know the point about a technology that involves looking at, at somatic difference and ordering at ordering the body, yeah, it might it might well be a problem problematic for that. Um, you know, if you're ordering oranges, hopefully you're not being racist. But uh, hmm? math is racist, so like yeah, right. Well, I I'm, I don't I I'm not I'm not arguing that these should not be used. But I'm sort of wondering. I'm just curious about where, how, how you sort of expose where the ordering is happening, and where, how you would expose and create reflexivity around around it. Right, right. I mean, I think, I think so. So broadly speaking, if if there's a broader awareness that that you know any kind of systems of quantification or ordering that involve the human body has a, ha, you know is, pot is potentially a racializing racist technology, then you then you want to order. You want to you want to make that very clear at every step, right? Um, yeah. It was a, uh, so, yeah. Oh, well, I want to be cognizant of time. I know some people may oh, need to take okay. a care of time. So maybe we should give everybody who needs to go a chance. Okay. And then if you're willing to stay. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm literally here all week. So um, <laughs> at the back, you had, you had another question. Uh, so I wanted to, can you go back to, um, you had Chun's definition of racism. Um, it's still kind of hung up on this, on, on how, to, how to respond. I mean, I, full disclosure, I've also written a couple of debunkings of these, of these papers. Um, that were similar to the sure. to the group of them. Yep. Um, Thanks. So this definition says that it's linked to schematic differences to make physical and mental characteristics. So the I, I maybe I may have stuck on your notions of somatic and what she means by somatic and mental. Right. Fair. Part of the main point of the, um, you know, one of the many attacks. By the way, you can also attack it as being very ineffective. The, the, the data. Page. Yeah, but ineffective in, attacks on ineffectiveness are, are are you can always improve. <laughs> I I I I'm I, uh, well issue, right? fair. I mean, if there's just if, I mean, if, if your face doesn't reveal your sexual orientation, you can't improve. It's as simple as that. <laughs> yes. Well, what, to, just not to derail you, to clarify, th there will always be attempts to find proxies that are, are claimed to, to sure. anyway, that's fine. Proxies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the, the point is, both, both of these are, are attacking, you know, one, one is saying, look, this is nothing inherent about the person, it's the facial expression. The other is saying, look, this is nothing inherent about the person's physiognomy, it is the social presentation. Um, which are sort of the same argument. Which are very similar arguments. Yeah. Um, I am still puzzled how those fit, how, how those, Support this, um, you know, notion of supporting race. They're 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 saying, look, these these systems are not doing. Well, 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 right. No, so so that's that's exactly the point. So those those so those are the examples that 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 Iarcus 
critiques aren't about race, right? They're about they're about other things, right? But but race is I mean, so the, so the Chinese point is there's, is this particular the kind of the way the way that race as a technique or a technology is about finding finding categories in the world that don't ascribing categories in the world that don't exist based on somatic features, right? Well, but what, what these uh, arguments are saying is that, it, is that it's not even picking up somatic features. It's picking up your plastic features of, of your expression or uh, of, your, uh, of, 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 your, of, your, of your social presentation rather than aspects of your Physiology. Well, but it, but they're but they're somatic. They're somatic differences in as much as they are they are external. On, they're on like they're they're on the body, right? I mean, it's not. Uh, anyway, that's maybe that's maybe that's the, the distinction. Whereas whereas facial recognition, right, is 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 looking at in theory the contours of of the body, but I don't think I don't think there's much of a distinction. I mean, I thought you had a good point that like the same people are involved in developing a camera which decides when to take a photo based on like what's worth taking a photo. Basically, it's the same. Sure. They're, they're right. Very closely linked to the same thing about like, how race can be used to, to create categories. Right. 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 And and again, and that's right. That's a, the goes back to the the emotion point. Yeah. So yeah. I have a question maybe about so race, race, but um, I mean you have this kind of self identification of race. Right. You, you certainly divide divide socially, kind of how we talked about yeah. Pat Star. This idea of you know someone can look at me and they make assumptions about my race, and that, that, that defines race. So what do you think the extent to using technology to do that, to, to find these somatic differences that we use to categorize people into races, which certainly is part of the definition of one's race? Um, and do you see any benefit of that? Right. No, no, right. And I and I really, I'm really aware, and I really, I want, I, def, I really defer to, I would want to defer to like critical race theorists on this too. I mean, I think actually Bruce Bruce Hayes, who is the you know, I quoted right, had had an, made a, made this point at Fat Star right, which is that you know the fact that that there are many let's see what's that tweet right the fact that the fact that ident like that that the the the, the Point is to d disentangle our positive notions of identity and community from these hierarchies of oppression and power. Right? His his point, right, is uh, is that racial hierarchies, you know, are produced are pro are produced to produce difference and produce hierarchy, and so. So I mean I think I think you're right. In the world we live in, you know, you, there is lot there's lots of, of, of benefit from, you know, and solidarity, you know, for for, find, for kind of kind of identifying yourself with particular with a particular with a particular race. Um, there's a great there there's a, there are a couple of great new books. One of them is which is Charlton McElwain's book coming out in October on on um, black activism from from like early like kind of the 60s through to Black Twitter. So like there's a, he's charting how in fact the, these technologies have been a, a kind of tool for 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 I would say progress. Positively progressive social formation, but I think I think I think under that is is again these kind of categories that were created and, and imposed in some ways, and, and that makes them as conceptually as conceptual categories problematic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. I'm going to go to just you, yeah, just yeah. gentlemen, because he hasn't spoken yet. This, I guess, touches the underlying point about technological determinism. I mean, to me. What's essential here is that you're using these technologies to ask questions about race or to make statements about race. And, and that's sort of what, what I understand to be where that problematic issue is wrapped up, not so much that, that sort of distinction. So how, what, yeah. how are you going uh, no, uh, yeah. between the, the, the question being asked and the technology being asked? Right, and and I think and I think that the I think the challenge here, and this is it's interesting that this is like right. This is, I think I think that there are some technologies, and I think te I think understanding technology as maybe you could call it, you know, kind of particular socio technical milieus, let's say, right, where that that have as as an emergent property. Uh, I shouldn't no take that back. I take that back. The, the technical properties of these systems. When applied to humans, whether or not they're, you know, whether whether the use case is intend, intended to be racist or, or not, produce this these these categorizations that are intrinsically problematic. I mean, that it's it's a it's like it's a kind of like a it's a uh, yeah. I mean, I, it's it's a really it's a really deterministic claim. 
Um, and I, I mean, I, uh, I don't usually make those, but I, I'm usually quite sympathetic to the kind of the kind of social construction case. But I just, and I think, and I think social construction. I mean, it's 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 the fit between the technology and the question in the world. It's still intermediate. You know, there's still a distinct, uh, specific but, relationship between those. Well, yeah, in as, mu in as much as the technology shapes the question, right? So the technology, the technology, you know, is not is is you know, the, the question you ask is, is is in some ways predicated by the techniques you use. And I think that's 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 kind of the point. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, well, no. I got, can, can I go to Anish because she hasn't spoken yet? Um, yeah. I just I keep thinking about like what what about. Um, situations where, like, not creating these categories means technological and social exclusion. Sure. Or also, also, also. This is right. So yeah. Like, totally. I guess, yeah. Or put another way, like, how does how does your work intersect with like the argument of somebody like? Or right, like right. Um, this this is a very a very live topic at Fat Star, um, and and produced uh, so in, in in it has produced some interesting subsequent conversations, especially around the, the piece that um, that Bruce Haynes wrote with Sebastian Benthal, which attempted to well so was, uh, articulated a, a, an alternative measure for racial segregation that wasn't based on race, which. Was a little a little mind boggling, um, and and prompted the critique basically uh, that was the, 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 I think I think the, which is the right way to think about it, which is to push the critique to the realm of politics, to say um, what what we need is to is to you know in some ways you know uh, focus on fo focus on on, 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 on on places where we can. We know the problem exists, right? We know that there's racial discrimination, right? We don't necessarily need to measure it. We, just, we I mean, we know it's there in, poli in policing, in in health disparities, right? And, and we and we also know how to f we also uh, know how to fix it, right? In some ways. And so, the point is not to to measure better or be more inclusive in measuring. It's to actually it's to actually like address the kind of the kind of systemic level grievances, and that will filter down in some way. I mean, that would be really concerning, but like. Just the power dynamics that would be in play if he decides to tackle such things. So I would be really fearful to say that, oh, I, you know, people know where the problems are, and there's no measurement of which problems are more important or how that's that's fair. I mean, I mean, what, what I'm, I'm articulate. So, I for, so for instance, I mean, in, in 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 work, you know, in some of the work on AI ethics and, and responses to, to AI, um, one of the things we've been looking at is the Movement for Black Lives policy platform, right? And they they have policy prescriptions that are outcome based and that are involved. So, okay, look, in in, in these particular in sec these sector by sector, don't use it here. Don't use it here. We know it's a problem here. We know it's a problem here. And that's what I'm that's what I mean. I mean, that's the kind of expertise that I'm yeah. talking about. Okay. Yeah. Um, and it has yeah it has to be expertise that is that is like communal and and participatory yeah um, oh sorry no, oh no. sorry yeah no. um, um, this is such a great topic thank you I couldn't help but think about parallels with DNA and um, and like Tim Tim Tobar's work in particular mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah I feel like that might be like an interesting way to anchor this so. That, she might say um, the reason. So she says, you know, DNA doesn't make you native, yeah. right? Like yeah. the categories of native that yeah. have been constructed through these DNA databases yeah. are constructions, and there's other things that yeah. make you native. But she might. We might say she might say, okay, but you wouldn't. She wouldn't give her DNA to these databases at all, even if somebody said, I'm going to use your DNA to kill, cure cancer because it's going into this database, who knows what's going to happen to it, and at the end of the day, um, it's going to, it could be used to reify these problematic relations. Similarly, I th this is what I'm reading into your talk, mm. that you're saying, okay, you may be using your facial recognition technology merely to count um, people in a room. But the data that's being collected vis-a-vis uh, -vis these technologies is being put in a database and could be reused for all of these other. Could be. Is, not, not isn't always, but could be. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It could be. And I, I mean, I don't know if that's like an appropriate. Obviously, the genetics case is. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, one thing I'd say, I think, I think I, if I if I understand her work right, I mean, I think I think Kim's 
here, the, 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 the analogous point, the analogous kind of expertise to, let's say, the movement for Black Lives is, is you know, is the, the, the kind of sociality of tribal, tribal customs and, tra and traditions, yeah, yeah. right? That's that's so that's kind of the the analog. Um, I think, I mean, if I if I follow your your point, yeah, I mean, I think, and I, I guess, yeah, I I guess the question about whether maybe I mean I mean it, it, that that actually it seems like it seems like the the, the point about curing cancer is maybe throwing me a little bit because I mean it, it, it's it's that that's a much that that seems to have a utility function that that like facial recognition might not but that's maybe a little bit off topic. Well, I mean, let's You're say about like a total absentee. Like a, a, just not participating at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying. Right. Is, is, right. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think because because of the fact that the data exists and that the data can yeah. be constructed. Yeah. 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 Right. Well. Right. Or, or or to not or to not participate or just to not have the thing be not have participation thrust upon you. Yeah. Well, yeah. Not yeah. just that it exists. That it exists in a particular form. That that like not only lends itself but is yeah. Sure. Sorry. Up, yes. 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 Right. Thank you, Anna. Like yeah. Right. And that's we're having the photograph. Yeah, the, you yeah. know the, the kind of the kind of polar and the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Meg, did you want to? Oh, uh, I was really curious about your uh, analogy to plutonium mm. for two reasons. The first one is uh, why plutonium when uh, many of us in this room have facial recognition devices in our pocket and it's being used so pervasively that a horse is out of the barn. And the second part of this question is that since facial rec recognition technology is so pervasive, how do you feel uh, subjectively about joining a small cadre of scholars saying that it is and should be stopped. Uh, what's your best case scenario? I mean, I don't, I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't know if it's as pervasive as, as maybe. I don't know if it's as pervasive as it could be. Certainly, it's not as pervasive as it could be. And I think, um, I, you know, I, I mean, I, I think it's, I think, I mean, I, I, I you know, you, I call. I, at one point, I, I call things like Animoji privacy loss leaders, right? Because they're they're kind of a, a kind of cute, effective way of engage of having people engage with the technology, you know, and and get, get used to the idea of, of having your face like you know scanned all the time. Um, so I guess you know I think the, I think the like with many technologies, the phone is a kind of conduit for all sorts of all sorts of like kind of problematic design things. But um, I don't know. I mean, I'm no. I mean, I I'm. I think I think I think the you know we we and I, I I include many many of the people in this room in this comment we have been working for a long time to to find ways to like mitigate and 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 work with and engage and um, you know do various things with tech companies about the social impacts of their technologies and um, and um, it hasn't done that much and so I, I think I think you know having going to a slightly more firm stance is is timely so um, was there a hand over here? You had you had a hand up, General Sir, over there. Yeah, it's not a really important thought, but I think it goes off to what Meg was asking, which is um, sure that uh, facial recognition technology could be more pervasive, but undeniably it has momentum, and that momentum is traveling towards broader and broader adoption in lots of different platforms. So did Hillary Clinton. What's that? So did Hillary Clinton. I mean, the point, which is the point, is to say that momentum. You know, momentum is a kind. It's you know, the more you believe in momentum, the more you have it. I mean, I guess, I guess, like, I mean, I mean. So, so an analogy that our that our colleague Dan Green makes is about nuclear power. Actually, you know, so after th Three Mile Island in the '70s, suddenly nuclear power didn't have any momentum anymore, right? No, no nuclear, nuclear. You know, I don't. I, I, no nuclear plant has been built in the United States in 30 or 40 years, or there's one, I think, right? So, stuff happens, right? Momentum is. You got momentum until you, you don't. Yeah, I, I, I was going to add on to that, just because the, the plutonium thing is overlapping with work we collaborate on, so I apologize. No, no, that's fine. That's okay. Time. Yeah. But yeah, but I think part of the reason uh, the you know, the uh, analogy works, despite the the difference in pervasiveness that you note, is that um, is that we're at a different moment in the development of the technology. So there was a time when like the when when nuclear technology is proliferating. Right, and then there are these accidents, and there are these things that happen to cause us to reverse course or to stop or to put more moratoriums on its use. Um, and and so the analogy is not like a contemporary one, but right, like it, it's it's, uh, right. it's, yeah. it's yeah. historical in that regard. Like I mean, we right. hit these moments with with facial recognition technology. Like, I mean, 
And some people would say, like, yes, many, many times, every single headline about like racist application of this is one of those moments. But then other, other people would kind of make the argument that no, we haven't, you know, we haven't had some sort of mass atrocity with Three Mile Island yet. And um, right. So I mean, anyway. I mean the, I mean the other, the, maybe it may be a potentially similar analogy is leaded gasoline. Right? So leaded gasoline, you know, has a long time. You know, that's what you did for 30, 40 years in the United States, and then, you know, the scientific consensus came around. Oh shit, this is this is like, del really deleterious, and 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 so it was phased out. Right? So that's maybe another example. Okay. Um, uh, this should probably be the last. Question. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, I'm, I'm, yeah. So, I'm fine with that. You know, so you're talking about. You know, the, the, Time, well, I think we can probably agree or you agree that the time is now for regulation of you know, tech companies who are racing forward with the technology and expanding its uses. But I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts about the problem of the culture of academia that's actually fueling this kind of technology. I mean, it, it, right here at the University of Washington, I don't know who's working on face facial recognition, but we certainly have people working on deep fakes, like the deep fake video mm -hmm. technology that's mm -hmm. the science department here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's hard to identify a positive use for that technology, and yet researchers will just keep on going forward for it. They don't necessarily have a personal profit motive involved. And, you know, they're, they're, they're simply doing a productive career. So, do you have any thoughts on on, on attacking like, the culture of developing normal technology? Yeah, I mean, I I had a I had a. This is something I've, I have been thinking about, and I, I was I had a, like a nice corrective, I think, from from John, you know, media, Jonathan Stern, who's a media historian, who sort of made this point that like, in on the one hand, he's like, well, in what in what field do people not like? What what, what, what fields do people stop researching stuff, right? Um, you know, just because they know it doesn't work, or just because they know it's kind of not a very interesting uh, addition. I mean, at a very broad level, right? So I think I think his, he was challenging this idea that there's something about the, the academy, there's something with the, uh, the academic computer science or academic engineering, whatever you want to call it, that is particularly unique. I mean, the thing that's unique is is the is the is the, is the, the affordance of the technology itself, right? If I keep if I like publish my if I like publish my book on Austin, even though 16,000 other people have published a book on Austin, that's you know the effects are like a little different. So. Um, I think that's an open, I think that's a, like, a good point, but I think it's an open question. I mean, I, I mean, I've been you know asking this question: What are the conditions? What are the kind of conditions, not social or regulatory, but the condition, the kind of intrinsic conditions around which people would not build things? And I'm not sure, and I don't think I've gotten a good answer to that. But I also may there may not be a good answer to that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So thank, you. thank you. Thank you. That's as. Thank you so much. As, as expected, a very, a very stimulating conversation. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks.